Hello, hello, testing, testing, hello. My name's Dylan Whiteman. It's uh, great to be here today. It's amazing being in a room uh, just full of Blender people where we all know the same 200 super easy shortcuts. So it's, it's quite a nice environment. Uh, my talk today is uh, 200,000 micro leagues underground, hashtag gold mining with Blender. And I, and I can see some of you thinking, I know how to use Blender. I could, I could do a bit of gold mining. And uh, the good news is uh, you could also do uh, copper mining and diamond mining. But actually, the thrust of the talk is on how to use Blender to visualize uh, 3D time-dependent data. Uh, the company I work for, Alexa Electronics, we have uh, designed and developed uh, some systems for the mining industry. These are, are probes that we bury deep underground, up to one to two kilometers underground and we can track the 3D movement of rock uh, as, as the miners draw the millions of tons of rock underground, often starting from a, a kilometer underground. And so our equipment, it's, it's a bit like when you launch a, a, a probe into space or something, once it goes, it's gone. You know, you, you can't do anything with it. Once we bury our stuff underground, we can only try to measure where it is and to communicate that data back to the miners and uh, we're using Blender to help visualize that data. So I'll be using quite a few examples from that. But actually, the real thrust of this talk is how Blender can be used to visualize measured data. And so in many ways, I'm probably also talking to a, a YouTube audience. You may have done a search about visualizing data. You might be a scientist or an engineer. And so this talk gives some examples of how you can go about that. And uh, in a few weeks' time, I'll upload some code to GitHub so people can have a bit of a play with it, particularly how you can use an external application like a C-sharp application, C++ application, whatever kind of application you want, to talk with Blender to get it to do what you want. If you're doing some sort of research with molecules and you want to visualize that in time, uh, this is the, this is the kind of what the talk is about. There'll be no code in here, but if you're interested in that, uh, look at the links when these are published and you can find them. Also, if you're a scientist or an engineer, just the general benefit of being able to generate 3D content to simplify uh, concepts, to show your colleagues, your bosses, your clients, what you're talking about, 3D can be quite useful. So just a little bit about the title. It's clearly taken from 20,000 leagues under the sea. And I thought, oh, 200,000 leagues underground. You know, I was playing with that sort of idea. And I said, how far is a league? How far is that? You know, is it five leagues underground? Well, it turns out a league is quite a way. <laughs> you could go to the moon 145 times a round trip uh, for 20,000 leagues. So hence my title is 200,000 micro leagues underground. So just before we get into some of the mining visualization stuff, uh, some of my history with Blender, I think I've been using it since about 2005. And in all that time, I've only managed to release two add-ons. <laughs> uh, one is an OSL lens flare uh, for cycles, and the, another one is a cutaway shader cycles, where you just, uh, you just add the node in to generate the lens flare. And here's a quick example of that. And is there a bit of sound on that too? We can all relax now. This uh, OSL shader was actually ported uh, from Render Man, and so it was the first time that I'd sort of got into OSL, so I was kind of excited that it worked at all, frankly, <laughs> and to get a few uh, lens flare type shapes up through that. So once I finished the shader, I thought, well, what could, I, uh, what could I work on next? I had a couple of ideas. I thought uh, perhaps, you know, a mirage shader. You can see this sort of mirage, maybe a lightning shader. This is actually an OSL lightning shader running. It obviously isn't beautifully rendered at all. Uh, you notice my, uh, my modeling skills is this high poly vehicle uh, passes the camera. And I, I'd, kind of <laughs> I'd kind of experimented there. We can see the nice mirage that looks good at a distance. And uh, I'd experimented with this kind of cutaway effect. And I thought, OK, the quickest one to do will be the cutaway shader. I'm going I'm to work on that. And so 
three years later, uh, I finished it. <laughs> it took quite a while. And uh, again, it's another OSL shader where you, you drop the cutaway shader in as a material node. And the interesting thing is you can cut away, you usually use booleans to cut away, but this just works on the material so you don't alter your mesh. And you can do extra things like visual effects, you can fade out the cutaway. So here's just a, a quick example of that in motion. This has some Okay, thank you. So you get the idea of that. It turns out to be one of the world's uh, most bizarre hobbies, uh, shading stuff in OSL. Uh, but an experience uh, also helped me for my, uh, for my work. So for the two systems I'm gonna look at today where we, we track stuff underground and visualize it in Blender, the Cave Tracker system and the Smart Marker system, uh, we've designed and developed these uh, in Australia and in Brisbane and I was the project manager for these two systems. Uh, the first one cost around about uh, $1.1 million to develop, and the second one's around about $4.5 million project, with probably another six investment by the mine just to, to test these things. These take a few years to test. So before we get into the visualization part, we'll just have a very quick, uh, the world's fastest mining tutorial. So there are, we're gonna look at three types of mine. There are, of course, more than three types of mine, but if you're mining gems or into metalliferous sort of mining, the big three would have to be open pit mining. You've probably seen lots of pictures of those. We're not gonna talk about that one at all. The next one is uh, sublevel caving, and by its very name, we can see from the surface here, we have many, 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 many levels. The levels are spaced about 30 meters apart, and it's not unusual to be 500 meters to a kilometer or even more underground. And uh, you blast, you, you basically collapse your level by blasting it. You do a blast every day 
and then you use a thing called an LHD, a load haul device, but in Australia they're called a bogger, and uh, you bog out, bog out the ring, it's called. <laughs> we bog out the ring and we drop, say, 10 to 20 tonnes of material through a one kilometre drop, strangely enough, and then it gets crushed underground and then sent back up to the surface. So that's a sub-level cave. And like most things that you get into, there's always problems, there are always issues to deal with. And a big one in, in the sub-level industry is, the, we, we can see a bit of blender here in the background. When you come in with your LHD after you've blasted, it's called a ring, because it, like it looks like a ring when you're in the tunnel. Uh, these orange things represent a, a, you know, an area that's blasted, it fractures all this material here, and as you dig it out, it, it flows down. And so one of the issues is that, you know, I would have expected that you'd probably get 100% of that material, but often you might get 40%. Uh, that's not un uncommon. Uh, but if it's, you know, if it's got diamonds or gold or copper in there, that's a lot of stuff that you're potentially missing. The next type of mine that we're going to look at is called a, a block cave. Uh, unlike the sub-level cave, it just has one extraction level down the bottom instead of extraction levels every 30 metres. And it kind of works by, let's, it mostly lets gravity do the work. You do an initial blast just to fragment the rock initially, but, and this is, this is a blender animation here, once you start drawing it out, then the force of gravity will crack the rock above it. And if we have a look at the next slide, it's the same, same sort of thing. We start drawing it out, the rock starts flowing down, it cracks the rock above it because it just can't take the stress. You imagine if you're in uh, many buildings and you took away some of these pylons, you know, the roof would fall in. And it's the same when you remove all that rock underground. It just can't take it. It starts to crack and then you can, it falls down. It causes the, rack, the rock to crack above it. That's called cave propagation. And you end up with a, you end up with, a, uh, with an interface between the solid uncracked rock and unfragmented rock and the fragmented rock. So you'd normally expect stuff to flow down, but what can actually happen, this is good timing, I'm glad that came up then, what can actually happen is you draw material from down here, we're about a kilometre underground, and instead of fragmenting the rock up here, it flows down this sort of barrier between these two zones, and actually the cave propagates up here. And perhaps you're also drawing material down here, so this is propagating up twice as fast. And often they'll put one mine under another mine and, and they'll still run the bottom one while the top one's finishing. And so it's important to know how quickly your cave is propagating and it's important to know a lot of other things. So why am I talking about this? You know, what's the motivation for burying lots of stuff underground? It's to figure out what's going on in the zone because there is no other technology in the world to figure out what's going on in that fragmented zone. So in the mining world, we could say, these are a lot of things that we're interested in. We could go on for pages and pages and pages. Uh, and there's very little that you can actually do about any of these things, but putting our instrumentation in the ground lets us track the flow and infer what's actually going on there. So let's go back to the sub-level cave. That's one with all the different levels in them. And you might remember that we're going to blast this ring here and we want to recover all the material. But let's say we're not. When they design these mines, there are big curves that point out for 10 years and they say for each month, probably how much money you're expecting to make based on the price of gold or whatever. And as they start the mine, they're tracking up how much they actually are. And you really don't want to be, you don't want to have one line under the other because it probably means that you're, you're missing out on something and, and your shareholders won't be happy. So one way to figure out how much you actually are getting, what's actually going on in there, is to bury what are called markers inside this volume. And in particular, our, our product's called Smart Markers. Again, it's the only thing of its type, which are blast resistant RFID devices, and they work as follows. This is not a blender animation, but uh, we, we paid a guy to do this, but he, he did a great job on this one. So the markers, we bury them in that ring, the ring gets blasted. If there happens to be a marker in this bogger, it'll be picked up by RFID readers in the, in the it's called the drive, in the top of the drive, and we can timestamp when that marker came out, and then we can equate that with how many we can equate that with how many tons were drawn, and you can find out exactly at what time these markers came out or didn't come out and how much of that volume you're extracting. 
again, this, this hasn't been done before, so it's kind of like primary research, what's actually going on in that rock volume when you draw, you know, thousands of tons worth of rock. Uh, the smart marker itself is actually part of a system, and uh, there's, of course, readers, and everything's hooked up to, to the network so we can upload the devices. Here's actually a device here embedded in a rock that worked. It, it transmitted its IED out, and we could tell that we extracted it. So here's some actual results from our, some of our first testing uh, in like 2008, 2009. Now this next animation, I did it, I think it was in 2.49, so it's, it's, I think it was my first animation, so it's a little bit basic. <laughs> but um, it actually shows the act actual data, even though it's animated, it's uh, animated data. We have a blast ring here on this side, a blast ring here on that side, and potentially three marker rings up here, and in the next part of the animation, it'll show the smart markers moving into position. So again, this is how it's useful if you're an engineer or a scientist. You can talk and talk and talk, but in a few seconds you can see, okay, we're underground, there's some holes here, okay, we're putting the markers up into the hole, we're going to blast it, withdraw the material, and in a few seconds uh, we'll see some of the data that was generated. We were quite excited at the time because no one had seen this sort of stuff, in including us. Uh, but this was primarily a system test where we're, we're checking that the system is working apart, you know, as opposed to trying the rock dynamics. So each of these green spheres, uh, each of these green cylinders lights up when a particular marker, marker was extracted. So we were quite happy with that, but there's, obviously there's no time stamping on here. It's quite a, quite a basic presentation. And so to do the visualization, what we really want is some tool where we can load and save data, something that can automatically analyze the data where we don't have to hand keyframe animate everything all the time. And we want some method so that miners can control 3D scene. And so uh, the solution was to use Blender, actually the Blender game engine in this case, in, in a 2.49B series, <laughs> and, uh, and hook it up to a separate C-sharp application. When you want to visualize data with Blender, generally, uh, with an external application, generally you, you want your external application written in whatever language, the language of your choice, and somehow send it to Blender. And so in this case, we're using C Sharp as a standalone client where the Blender game engine actually ran as a server and most of the code was in that. And so here's a, a quick video of it operating. On the left here, we can see just normal windows, C Sharp windows. And here we can see the Blender game engine. You can navigate the scene normally as you'd expect, or you can also use these controls up here in the C Sharp which is quite responsive actually, to, to change the scene as well, to expand out the ring. And so this particular program here, we could suck up all the data from underground when these hundreds and hundreds of markers got extracted. They're color coded, uh, green means primary extraction, you want to see those come out, you want that rock to come out when you're drawing it. Red means it actually came out early, we were drawing from here, but it came out from the next ring. And sometimes things come out a year or two later and they also get different colors. And so uh, this sort of system worked, worked pretty well. Some of the pros of using, in, in this case, the game engine uh, and, and using the server client model was that it was really good for scene interaction. You could really control your scene quite easily. And uh, it was, I didn't show it in the video, I, I clicked through it, but you can also click on items in the scene and have information about what you've clicked on appear on your, th on your uh, Windows display. So in this case, you might click on a, a particular marker and you could say, oh, it came out so many tons into the drawer. And I guess in this crowd, you're probably not as interested, but we were very excited with some of this stuff because for the first time we were seeing when they were drawing, say, from this area here, markers were actually being extracted from the next ring that hadn't been blasted yet. And what that tells us is it's called dilution. That means you're pulling material in from some region that you're not targeting. And that could be uh, a lower grade ore, which is going to bring down your recovery. Or it might even be a high grade ore, which kind of means you're stealing it. <laughs> you, you might want to get that high grade ore later. And these blue ones in particular here, these came out like a, a year later, uh, further down in the system. Some of the cons of using particularly the game engine was uh, 
it pretty much ran one of the cores. If you've got an eight-core machine, it would take over one of the cores and pretty much run it at 100%, and you'd hear the, hear the fan going like mad. And you can require a fair amount of game engine Python code if you go that route as well, but it worked pretty well. I think when Blender 2.8 comes around, of course, it doesn't, I don't think it has the game engine in it, but it seems with Eevee you could still run the server client model and pretty much do the same thing. I understand in 2.8 perhaps some of the UI can be turned off, uh, which is good if you're sending it to clients because you don't want them to go into sculpting mode by mistake and all that sort of thing. So let's have a look at the, the, second, uh, the second type of mine that we're looking at, the block cave mine. With these ones, we bury devices that we can track underground. And again, no one, no one has ever done this before. So if these red dots here are called beacons, when they draw material through the extraction points, the rock will fall down and the beacons will move with the rock. And the beacons have an extremely strong magnet inside uh, that's rotated at an extremely precise frequency. And we use triaxial magnetometers. That's just a fancy way of saying an electronic compass that points in three directions. And we can detect the magnetic field from each of these beacons. And from that, we can determine how far away they are. And you've probably heard of triangulation. We use like a 3D triangulation to determine the 3D point of the, of the beacons. Again, the cave tracker beacons are part of a, a bigger system where there's communication adapter models, there's a server. It's, quite, it's amazing, actually. I, I find it amazing you can sit in a room and know that you're talking to some device a kilometre underground in Mongolia or something like that. And I, and I know we use the internet all the time to download stuff from everywhere, but it's still kind of weird to think you're talking to these uh, devices buried underground. Here's a picture of, of, of one of the beacons. Uh, such a strong magnet, you know, you can stick the glasses case, will just absolutely <laughs> stick to the side of that. They're pretty strong. So the next thing I'm going to show is uh, that system in operation and the visualization from Blender. After all the pre presentations today and the amazing visual effects that were seen, I guess it's not going to look as spectacular. It's just going to look like a bunch of orange dots. Uh, but, but to us, it's a quite an important set of orange dots because they, they tell us exactly what is, what is moving where. For example, this, this is, I'm, I'm not showing any, we have a lot of customer data and I'm not showing any customer data that hasn't already been put online. So this particular, um, what I'm going to show came, came from a diamond mine in northwestern Australia. Uh, it's, we're still tracking these devices today. And the model that we're using here is the external application is C Sharp. And it actually generates uh, a text file uh, full of Python code and then we just load that up into Blender. So the model here is you use whatever tool you want to generate all, analyze the data, generate the positions, and then it generates pretty simple Python code. Mostly it says something like, instance had an object here, color it this, and then X keyframes later, move it to here, except so on and so forth. And so you're just repeating the same simple blocks over and over with this type of model. The things to watch out for uh, on this video, these panes here all show different views. So we've got a top-down view here. We've got a view to the side and sort of an orthographic view. And you can see the date. And so you guys are probably the first people in the world outside of the mining community to ever see this sort of stuff. This, this is material moving, you know, hundreds of meters underground. So having said that, it still just comes down to orange dots. And here they go. And it was amazing putting this together, actually. I had to code this part within 24 hours <laughs> for a presentation, and, but it shows how extendable Blender is. You can, it, its Python API is extremely extensible. If you can visualize it in your head, you can probably show it on the screen. And I wonder if it's possible to get that one to show again. Maybe I'll just, I'll just let me just try this. So we come through. Yep, it's going, it's going. You notice over here, these two are going to take off. Wham, bam. And so, again, it might not seem like too much, but that's a phenomena called rat holing. And it was more of a hypothetical phenomena in some ways uh, before it could actually be measured. People suspect there were very fast moving zones because holes would pop up on the surface way quicker. 
but now we can actually put devices underground and you can determine when some of these phenomena are occurring. And many other phenomena too. You can end up with a situation in a mine where you're drawing millions of tons worth of material, but if it's not coming from where you think it should be coming, there could be whole areas that are hanging up. You could be creating large air gaps and voids, uh, and that has killed people. It's, it's a very, very dangerous thing if you create an air gap in the wrong sort of situation. And so with this tool, uh, by embedding devices underground and monitoring where they're going every couple of days, you can see how you're running into any of those scenarios and change your draw strategy. Some of the pros of the, I call it like the fee forward keyframe model, it's pretty simple. It's just the same code blocks over and over and over. So you get your program like C Sharp to generate them and away it goes. The great thing about Blender, I find it amazing, we often get DXFs from the mine and the datum point for these structures can be 40 kilometers here, 80 kilometers over here and 10 kilometers up here. Uh, I just import the DXF straight away into Blender and I don't have to re-reference them to zero and it, it all just works. Strangely enough, I have to use still 2.49b to import the DXF, so it's got a really good DXF importer. Then I save the blend file, then I open 2.79 uh, to do the work. Now, the last thing I'm gonna show is the same sort of model. It's a fee forward keyframe model. Uh, it looks, I, I might as well just show it. <laughs> When, when we're designing a mine, uh, an installation for a mine, there are some of it can be quite expensive. So uh, again, I've just fabricated this, this particular example. But let's say we, the mine is down here, a kilometre underground, and we think, OK, we're going to need three or four holes here for detectors, and we want to put a, like a one kilometre hole underground. Those holes can cost a million dollars each. So you don't want to get them in the wrong place. And so, we use Blender to help do the simulations about would the system work if we carried out an installation with the holes in these placed places and if we drop virtual beacons through the ground. So here we can see our external application and you can see I've got a couple of holes defined that correspond to these holes. So here's hole number one and we can see hole number one, hole number one. Here's its position in Blender where we think it should go and in the simulator, we've got the same coordinates and it's a kilometre deep hole. Hole number two, here it is here. We can see in our simulator, we have the same coordinates. So this is just to visually get an idea of where these holes are gonna go and so on and so forth. And so in the simulation app, I think in the next point, we just turn off the surface. So we give it a second. This all seemed to run a lot faster in the hotel when I put it together. <laughs> so here we go. So what we're gonna do is, the simulator is gonna generate a grid of 15 by 15 beacons and drop them through that one kilometer surface and we're gonna see how well they track. It takes about um, 30 or 40 seconds to do, for C Sharp to do the analysis on it. It's doing millions of calculations. And there we are, it's completed. And what, that, what it's actually done, it's produced a text file in this path here that we're just gonna open up. It's a text file full of Python code. And if we just open it up into, well, here we are here, we've gone from the external application to the text file that we're gonna load into Blender. If we open up the text file and, and just a notepad editor or something. So here we go, it starts at line one and if we come down to the end of the file, the computer has just generated 300, uh, 350,000 lines of Python code in about a second. It, it amazes me how quick computers are. So let's load in those 350,000 lines of Python code with all the keyframe data into Blender, uh, which we do just by clicking the handy lifesaver icon <laughs> and then clicking run script. And it takes Blender about eight seconds or so to compile it. And here's the, the visualization part. So these blue things represent the detectors in our system that detect the beacons. Uh, you can see they're in our hole locations. And the red dots represent the beacons. Okay. And so we can see that uh, if we scroll along the timeline, that grid will drop through. And we can see uh, the green ones are red 
uh, the green ones are track beacons and the red ones are non-track beacons and I'll finish up just a second. And I'm not gonna show the next part of the video but, but what it shows is we quickly go back into the simulator and we can add another hole in in just a few, few minutes and then re-simulate it and then using Blender we can see what areas of the mine are tracked. And right now in, in Brisbane of Australia, one of the guys, I think Jake, is fine tuning some of these holes with Blender uh, to go in a mine in Mongolia as we speak. So what are the conclusions? And so this is for the online audience as well, uh, knowing hopefully at the bottom of the video they can click to go to some GitHub code, uh, pre-prepared -pre code. But Blender, it's a pretty effective tool for visualization. If you can picture it in your head, you can probably visualize it in Blender. The server client-based model uh, works, works pretty well, and hopefully with 2.8, the, the new version coming out soon, uh, perhaps it can be linked in with Eevee in a, in a nice way. And also the feed forward keyframing model works pretty well as, as well. And sometimes you can actually separate the code out from the data and it becomes even faster. So finally, uh, thanks for having me here. Again, for the online audience, if you're new to Blender, I don't think anyone in this room is new to Blender, but if you are new to Blender, uh, there's tons of great tutorials, but some by Andrew Price and CG Cookie have some very good uh, beginner ones. If you wanted to get started with the Python Blender API, uh, then Michael Anders uh, Blender Su and Jimmy Gunner one with Blender Sushi have some fantastic websites and also Stack Exchange. So thank you very much. Cheers.